Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We have spoken about the three ways in which the had punishment of a zina is established. Let us move on with our discussion here on the had punishment of a zina. And hadith number 1053. Hurairah from Abu Huraira, the Prophet ﷺ said, If the servant woman of any one of yours commits zina and it is clear that she has committed zina then you should give her the had punishment and you should not censure her or scold her any further then if she does it a second time then give her the had punishment but do not scold her any further and if she does it a third time and it is clear that she has committed zina then you should sell her even if it is for a strand of hair muttafaqun alayh Hadith number 1054 Ali From Ali, the Prophet ﷺ said, Establish the had punishments on your servants. The hadith is Hassan. So both of these hadith have the same thread running through them. It is about giving the had punishment on your servants. So we learn that the master of the servant is allowed to give the had punishment on his own servant. And that it does not have to be the ruler or the deputy of the ruler. So this would be a difference between a free person and a servant. Because with a free person, it has to be the ruler or his deputy who is in charge of carrying out the had punishment. The Prophet ﷺ says in the first narration that if the servant girl commits zina, then you give her the had punishment, but you do not rebuke her or blame her for anything afterwards. Why is that? Because she has served her punishment for the zina, so you don't punish her twice for the same sin. And the opinion of the majority of the scholars of the Madahib, Al-Imam Ahmad, Al-Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa is that the master carries out the had punishment. Al Imam Malik says, no, even with a servant, the ruler must be in charge of carrying out the had punishment just like everyone else. And the reason why you do not scold your servant afterwards or you do not blame him or censure him is because this type of action of scolding them or telling them off or blaming them is in and of itself a ta'zir punishment. So the point is you do not combine between a had punishment and a ta'zir punishment. Once you've served your had punishment for the appropriate sin, zina in this case, then you are not allowed to be punished anymore. And if somebody was to do this, then this would clearly be injustice. If she commits the zina a third time, then the Prophet has ordered the master to sell this woman because it has become known now that zina is part of her nature. And her nature, although everyone is born with a good nature, is now corrupted. And so there is no good in keeping a woman like this, because in keeping a woman like this, it would be a disgrace on the reputation of the master himself. So the point is, you have to sell her even if it is with the cheapest price, even a strand of hair. You have to get rid of a woman like this. And the wisdom behind selling this woman is firstly to protect the reputation of the master, of course, so he's not known as a day youth who puts up with licentious women and then secondly the benefit is for the servant woman herself because if she moves to another master and changes her environment then this change of environment could lead to a change in her attitude and hopefully this will lead to the prevention of her committing zina there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to whether this order to sell her is by way of obligation or recommendation but we certainly say that a man must not be known as a day youth in a Muslim society. This is a real blemish on his honor. Of course, in a Kafir society, it's no big deal that a man be a day youth. In fact, it's quite normal and it's all part of their freedom, which they are so proud of. But in a Muslim society, it is quite different. 
Now we know that the had punishment of zina, if a person is not a muhsan, is twofold. Firstly, it is the hundred whips, and secondly, it is to banish them from their homeland for one lunar year. Let us look at this punishment in the light of a servant though, and particularly a servant woman. Firstly, the hundred lashes. We know and we have evidence that a servant woman, if she commits zina, is not lashed a hundred times. Rather, we know she is lashed fifty times only. The evidence for this is found in the Qur'an. After he gives permission to marry the servant women, he says about them, فَإِذَا أُحْسِنَّ فَإِنْ أَتَيْنَ بِفَاحِشَةٍ فَعَلَيْهِنَّ نِصْفُ مَا عَلَى الْمُحْسَنَاتِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ So if they become muhsan, meaning they have been taken in wedlock, and they've had the intercourse within wedlock, then if after that they commit zina, then their punishment is half of what the free women would receive. So the point is, with adultery, the servant women are not stoned to death, but rather they receive 50 lashes, which is half of the 100 lashes, which is what a free woman would receive. So if she commits zina, it would be 50 lashes, and if she commits adultery, it would not be stoning to death, it would be 50 lashes as well. So that ruling is clear enough, but then the difference of opinion would be, what about a male servant? Do we treat him in the same way? In other words, do we give him 50 lashes as well, or would it be 100 lashes? So some scholars say, even though we don't have a particular text about the male servant, but we can use analogy and give him the same punishment, because they both are servants, whether it be a male or a female. And the point about a servant is that servants don't have the same status or the same honour as the free people. And so this is why we can afford to give them half of the punishment. And so therefore, if a servant was to commit zina, be he a male or a female, then the people would not really think that much of it. True, it is a sin without a doubt, but it's not the same thing as a free person who has honour and respect committing zina. This would be a real tarnish on his character and on his reputation. And the general people around him will think much of it. Therefore, the punishment needs to be even more severe to act as a severe deterrent. But the severity is not quite the same with a servant. So this is a big difference. Other scholars may disagree. They may say that with a female servant, it could be the case that her master uses her to commit zina and he takes the price for it. So this woman becomes accustomed to zina. And so this is why her punishment would be less, whereas the same thing is not said about the male servant. Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the Qur'an, وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ إِنْ أَرَدْنَا تَحَصُّنًا لِتَبَتَهُ عَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا And do not force your servant women into prostitution if they want to be chaste, just so you can earn the perishable goods of this world. And so basically this is what some masters would do. They would act like a pimp. And so Allah Jalla wa'ala forbids this practice. So because of this, some scholars have said that a male servant receives exactly the same punishment as the free person, which would be the hundred lashes. As for the stoning to death, then that only applies to a muhsan. And we said that the muhsan is the one who has intercourse in a valid nikah contract when both he and his wife are balig, aqil and hur. And hur, of course, is free. But in any case, the majority of the scholars, they say that both the male and the female servant, if they commit zina, their punishment is 50 lashes and not 100. And this would be an example of where we make a takhsis of a general ruling in the Qur'an by way of analogy. So the general ruling in the Qur'an is that the fornicator receives 100 lashes. We have a takhsis made from the Qur'an, by the Qur'an, in that the female servant is whipped only 50 lashes. And we also have a takhsis made of the Qur'an by way of analogy, in that the male servant is whipped 50 lashes only. So this is an example of where a qiyas makes a takhsis of the general ruling in the Qur'an. Okay, what about the taghrib, which is to banish this person for one year? What the hadith of this chapter is telling us is that the servant woman is not banished for one year because the Prophet did not say so. So some scholars say that this servant is not banished for one year because in doing so this would be a harm on the master of the servant. The master needs the servant to work for him. Some other scholars say 
that the servant is banished, but not for one year, rather half a year, because Allah Jalla wa ala says that these servant women will have half the punishment which the free women receive. Well, the free woman would receive the punishment of a hundred lashes and banishment for one year. Well, then the servant woman should receive 50 lashes and banishment for half a year. And they say that this idea of banishing, causing harm to the master, well, even if the servant commits a zina, that would be harm to the master because the value of the servant would decrease. And even whipping the servant could be a harm to the master as well. But if in the case that the master fears that the servant will run away if he is banished, then the master needs to take precaution. Maybe he leaves the servant in the other land with somebody who would look after him and will always stick to him. Or perhaps he could put the servant up to work for someone else in return for payment. If no such arrangements can be made, then you would not banish the servant for half a year. What about other had punishments? Well, for stealing, yes, the master would carry out the punishment of cutting off the hand, but this is upon the condition that he knows how to do this properly. If he does not know how to do this properly, then it would be upon him to refer to somebody who does know. Hadith number 1055 from Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu an will go into the translation that a woman from Juhayna came to the Prophet والسلام, and she was pregnant from zina. And so she said, O Prophet of Allah, I have done something for which a had punishment is necessary, so establish it upon me. And so the Prophet called her wali and he said to her, treat her well and when she delivers the baby, then bring her to me. And so this happened and it was ready for her to take the had punishment. So the Prophet wrapped the clothing around her tightly so that any of her skin does not become exposed. And then she was ordered to be stoned to death. And then thereafter, the Prophet prayed the Asat al-Janazah upon her and Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to the Prophet, Are you praying upon her, O Prophet, whilst she had committed zina? And the Prophet said to Umar, لَقَدْ تَابَتْ تَوْبَةً لَوْ قُسِّمَتْ بَيْنَ سَبْعِينَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ لَوْ وَسِعَتْهُمْ وَهَلْ وَجَدْتَ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ أَنْ جَادَتْ بِنَفْسِهَا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى رواه مسلم. He said, she has made a tawbah which if it was to be distributed amongst 70 people of Medina, it would be enough for them. Have you seen a better tawbah than the one who sacrifices his own self for Allah Ta'ala? Muslim reported it. This question of Umar radiallahu an was not a question of rebuke. Rather, it was a question of inquiry. So we can take many points of benefit from this hadith. We can take that it is permissible for you to ask for the had punishment to be established upon you in order to purify yourself from the sin, just as this woman did here in her case of zina. So here we find people could ask to be stoned to death, even though stoning to death is incredibly horrid. And the reason for this is quite simple. They want to be purified from their sin because they know that the punishment of the hereafter is far worse than any punishment in this world, no matter how horrid the punishment in this world could possibly be. We take that if a person acknowledges himself or confesses that he committed zina, then the punishment is only established if he asks for the punishment to be established. This is different to if the zina is established by way of evidence through the four testimonies. Then the punishment is established whether the sinner or the fornicator likes it or not. But if the zani confesses then we establish the had punishment if they ask for it. This is why when Ma'iz ran away from the had punishment, it means he did not ask for the had punishment anymore. And this is why the Prophet told the companions, you should have left him alone, so perhaps he would make tawbah. So in this narration we find the Prophet established the had punishment not because she confessed to committing zina, but rather she asked for the punishment to be established upon her because she wanted purification. So notice the difference between confessing to zina and asking for the had punishment of zina to be established upon you. We take from this that the general practice amongst the Sahaba and the Prophet in those days would be that the woman would have a wali who would look after her. This would normally be the father and when she is married this would be the husband. Basically she needs a male companion to look after her. Allah Jalla wa ala has made the men as guardians and protectors of the women. So definitely, because of the weakness which the woman has, 
both physically and emotionally and intellectually, she needs a guardian. And we also take the valuable lesson that if the woman is pregnant because of zina, of course, we cannot establish the had punishment. She has to deliver the baby first. Then after that, if you can find somebody to breastfeed the baby, then the punishment can be established. If you cannot find anyone, then she will breastfeed the baby, and then afterwards the punishment is to be established. We also take that when the had punishment is being established, then the clothing needs to be wrapped around properly and firmly so that the woman is not exposed. Also we take that the one who has committed a major sin, and if he dies, you are allowed to pray the Islat al-Janazah over him. Of course, this woman committed the major sin, but she repented afterwards. So this major sin then is wiped away. So there is no problem in praying over a person like this. But even if a person does not repent from a major sin, still you pray the Salat al-Janazah over him because he's still a Muslim. And we do not hold the Khawarij opinion that the one who commits a major sin without repenting is a kafir. Sometimes it could be that the major people in the society, like the high-end scholars or the ruler, they may not pray Salat al-Janazah over a person who has committed a major sin or is known to be an evildoer, and this is to repel others from following his ways. So this would be permissible. But as for the rest of the folk, then they must pray Salat al-Janazah. It is Fard Kifaya. We know, for example, the Prophet did not pray the Salat al-Janazah over the one who killed himself. There is a difference of opinion here. The one who is being stoned to death, do you dig a hole for him to go in or not? Some scholars have said that if the had punishment is established by way of witnesses, then you do dig a hole so that the person cannot escape. If he is being punished by way of confession, then you do not dig a hole in order to give him the opportunity to escape if he wants to, just like Ma is did. Some say you do dig a hole for the women, but not for men, because this is more concealing for them. And some other scholars say that in all cases, it's down to the ishtihad of the Imam. And this seems to be the most flexible opinion, that we leave it down to the Imam. Because the point is that some narrations do say that when Ma'iz was being stoned, that a hole was dug up, and others don't mention this. So we'll just leave it down to the ishtihad of the Imam. This narration, is this a virtue of this woman or not? Well, we say yes, it is a virtue of this woman, because committing a sin is one thing, but when you repent from this major sin, then it becomes a virtue. It does not become your vice. So we say this narration is in fact a virtue of this woman, not a vice. And we take that this woman had such a repentance that it could be enough for 70 people of al Medina. And the Prophet himself said that she made the best type of repentance. She sacrificed herself for Allah Jalla wa ala. So you can see the type of ikhlas or the sincerity that she had. So this idea of sacrificing yourself for Allah Jalla wa ala, most often this would happen in a battlefield. But is it permissible to commit suicide in the battlefield? The scholars say that certainly running into the enemy lines and fighting valiantly is good and virtuous, but it's not the same as suicide because with suicide, your intention is to kill yourself. But fighting valiantly in the front lines, your intention is not to kill yourself, rather it is to kill your enemies. True, you are at a greater risk of killing yourself, but this is not your intention and your deeds are judged by your intention. Ibn Taymiyyah says that if in killing yourself, this would lead to a greater benefit for most of the people, then it is permissible to do so. And he takes his evidence from the story of the boy from Bani Israel who told the king to take an arrow and then to shoot it at him. And before that, the king should say, in the name of the Lord of this boy. And when he did that, the arrow struck the head of the boy. The boy touched his head where the arrow struck and he fell down and died. But when the people saw this, they believed in the Lord of this boy, meaning they believed in Allah Jalla wa ala. And so all of them became Muslim. And so the king simply could not take this because of his jealousy and his hatred for Iman. So he dug up a trench and it had fire in it and he threw everybody into this trench. And this is what Surat Al-Buruj speaks about. So he says that in a situation like this, suicide is permissible. But in normal situations, doing something in which you intend suicide is haram. Hadith 1056 وَعَنْ جَابِرِ بِنْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا قَالْ 
wa rajulan min al-yahud wa mar'atan rawahu muslim from jabir ibn abdullah he says that the prophet stoned a man from the tribe of aslam a man from the yahud and a woman so this narration simply gives us evidence that stoning to death is from the sunnah and from the narration of umar we know that it is not abrogated so there must not be anyone saying that because we don't find it in the quran therefore it is not part of the sharia it needs to be known also that there must not be any transgression in the had punishment so if a woman is pregnant she is not to be stoned to death because this would be a transgression against the child and the child is innocent but now comes a question which one is better if you commit zina is it better for you to keep it quiet and make sincere tauba or is it better for you to go to the qadi and take the had punishment the ulama say it is better for you to make tauba yourself just like you would with any other sin and in addition to making tauba with all the five conditions complete of course you increase in your good deeds but having said that we say as we did before it is permissible for somebody to confess the zina and ask for the punishment to be established upon him he might do this because he does not trust that his tauba would be sufficient if you make tauba there is no way you know that this tauba would be accepted at best you can hope it would be accepted but you cannot be certain whereas if you take the had punishment then this is something physical and you can see it happening before your eyes and you are being punished nobody can deny this and so you can be certain that your sin of zina would be wiped away because of this had punishment because it is something physical that you can see and feel and we know you will not be punished for zina twice so if you've taken it in this world you will not take it in the hereafter whereas the same thing cannot be said with tauba you don't know if your tauba would be accepted or not you don't know about your ikhlas so this is the reason why some people would opt for the safer option which would be the stoning to death we have evidence that the prophet did not pray the salat al janaza for two types of people the one who killed himself and the one who made ghulul and about the ghal the prophet ali salatu wasalam said to the companions sallu ala sahibikum you people pray for your companion but the prophet did not do so and when they checked his baggage they found a small amount of wealth which this man took from the war booty and ghulul is a major sin allah jalla wa ala says wa man yaghlul ya'ti bima ghalla yawm al qiyama whoever makes ghulul then he will come with the wealth which he stole on yawm al qiyama so in total from the narrations five people were stoned to death one man and one woman from the yahud as two we have maiz as three we have the wife of the man who hired the hireling that's four and we have this woman from juhayna that's five now al-imam al-shawkani and al-san'ani say that this woman from juhayna was actually a woman from ghamid so she is ghamidiya and they say that is correct so in any case we have at least five examples of people being stoned to death from the sunnah and from the statement of umar we realize that all of this is not abrogated hadith number 1057 from sa'id ibn sa'ad ibn ubada radiyallahu anhuma he says amongst our household there was a weak man and he committed zina with a servant woman so they mentioned this to the prophet and the prophet told them idribuhu hadda give him the had punishment and they said ya rasul allah innahu adhaf min dhalik o messenger of allah he is weaker than that meaning he won't be able to take the had punishment and so the prophet then said khudhu ithkalan fihi mi'atu shimrakh thumma idribuhu bihi darbatan wahida fafa'alu he said take a branch of a date palm tree which has a hundred twigs and give him one strike with it and that's what they did this hadith is sahih la ghayri so from this narration we take that even a weak man can still commit zina so you might not expect somebody who is weak or perhaps old to commit zina but you don't know that the shaytan runs inside the people just like blood does and anything is possible still we find here that the prophet did not order him to be banished for one year does this mean that the banishment is not part of the sunnah no it doesn't rather this is mutashabih this narration because it could be that this man was a servant and upon one opinion the servant is not banished or perhaps it could be that the banishment was not possible in his particular case 
Either way, we leave the mutashabih and we go with the muhkam. And we simply say that the absence of evidence from a particular source is not evidence of absolute absence. So this narration does not prove that there is no banishment for one year, because the proof is established through other sources. We find from this narration that the objective of the had punishment is not just causing pain, but rather it is to serve as a kafara, it is to serve as a deterrent, and also it is to serve as a ta'deeb, or to put some etiquettes into the man who has committed this sin, in order to rectify his character. Because whipping this man with one branch like this, with a hundred twigs, is not going to cause a great amount of pain. The man is weak himself. So this proves that the idea behind the had punishment is more than just causing pain for the sin which he committed. We find in this hadith the Prophet is using a hila, or a strategy, or a device. And perhaps some people of desires will use this hadith to argue in favor of using a hila. So they might use this hadith and try to justify making halal what Allah has made haram. But we simply say this, that the type of hila which is halal in Islam, like the one we have seen in this narration, is the hila in which you are trying to establish what Allah Jalla wants you to do. As opposed to the haram type of hila, which is what the Muslims of desires would want you to do, which is to circumvent one of the prohibitions of Allah Jalla For example, riba. In other words, they are trying to get around a wajib action. But in this narration, the Prophet is trying to establish a wajib action. So notice the difference. If a person is weak because of an illness, then we can wait for him to regain his strength and to be cured from the illness, then the had punishment can be established on him. If his condition is not going to improve, then with the had punishment you would have to improvise, just as the Prophet did here. But the point is that the had punishment is not dropped. And this punishment or scenario here in this narration is similar to how Ayyub salam, took an oath to whip his wife a hundred lashes because she said something which angered him after he regained his health. And when he did, he regretted this action and so Allah Jalla wa'ala told him خُذْ بِيَدِكَ دِغْثًا فَضْرِبْ بِهِ وَلَا تَحْنَثْ And take in your hand a bundle of thin grass and strike your wife once with it. But do not break your oath. Hadith number 1058 وعن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من وجدتموه يعمل عمل قوم لوط فاقتلوا الفاعل والمفعول به ومن وجدتموه واقع على بهيمة فاقتلوه واقتلوا البهيمة رواه أحمد والأربعة ورجاله موثقون إلا أن فيه اختلافا From Ibn Abbas the Prophet said Whoever you find doing the actions of the people of Lud السلام, then kill the doer and the one on whom it is being done and if you find somebody who is having sexual intercourse with an animal then kill this person and also kill the animal. This hadith is sahih. So this hadith talks about two abhorrent actions. Firstly, homosexuality. And then secondly, bestiality, which is having sexual intercourse with an animal. Allah Jalla wa'ala describes this homosexuality in the Qur'an as khaba'if. And also he describes it as fahisha. So fahisha has this idea of being shameless. And khaba'if is everything which is either sinful or physically or spiritually impure. As Allah Jalla wa'ala says, Al-khabithatu lil-khabithina wal-khabithuna lil-khabithat. The impure or evil women, meaning mainly the fornicating women, are for fornicating men, and the fornicating men are for fornicating women. So these sexually debauched women are for sexually debauched men, in other words, and vice versa. So this khabith or khubuth has this idea of being either sinful or impure, either physically or spiritually. The reason why the Prophet says that this action is the action of the people of Lut even though the people of Lut are not the only people who are performing this action, nowadays we find many homosexual men. And the problem of this is probably more widespread now than it was back then. But the reason why he refers to the people of Lut is because they were the first people to perform this action out of the whole of mankind. In the Qur'an, Lut says to his people, 
ولوطا إذ قال لقومه أتأتون الفاحشة ما سبقكم بها من أحد من العالمين And when Lut alayhi salam said to his people, Do you approach a fahisha, a shameful action, meaning this action of male homosexuality, which no one from the alameen, meaning mankind and jinn kind, before you has committed. So you see here from this ayah in Surah Al-A'raf that these people were the first ones to institutionalize this action. And so what was the result of this action and the consequences and also the end of this type of people? Allah Jalla wa'ala says in Surah Hud فَلَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا جَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَافِلَهَا وَأَمْطَرْنَا عَلَيْهَا حِجَارَةً مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ مَّنْضُودٍ مُسَوَّمَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ وَمَا هِيَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ بِبَعِيدٍ And when our order came, we turned their city, the top part, into the lower part, meaning he made the city topsy-turvy. And we rained down upon them stones of baked clay arranged in order one after the other, so in layers. In other words, they had layers of stone dropped down upon them. He goes on to say, مُسَوَّمَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ They were marked by your Lord, and they were not far away from the evildoers. This idea of being marked by the Lord, what does this mean? Some of the Mufassirin have said that these stones had the name of the person they were going to kill etched into them. So this was their punishment then, it was twofold. The city being turned upside down and they being stoned to death from Allah Jalla wa'ala with these stones of baked clay. So what this hadith of the chapter is telling us is that this Homosexuality between men is a major sin as it incurs this type of had punishment which is the execution. Somebody might say, but two people doing it out of consent, what harm could there be to society? Actually, it does produce harm to society. It propagates AIDS and we don't know in future it could propagate other types of mutated sexually transmitted diseases. So Allah Jalla wa ala knows best when he gives the ruling because he knows what an action will end up as. As for our vision, the human vision, then we can only see in this present, or at least to the near future anyway. But Allah Jalla wa'ala, his frame of reference is infinitely wider than ours. He knows exactly the ins and outs of a particular action and how it will end up as and the results thereof. But the point is that homosexuality does have a societal damage in that it is responsible, just like other forms of zina, it is responsible for sexually transmitted diseases being spread throughout. So this is something which male homosexuality and zina in general is responsible for. And this is just one of the dire consequences and Allah Jalla wa'ala knows best what the other dire consequences are. Somebody might say, yes, but this urge of homosexuality, it is natural. So how can you prevent that which is natural? Because some men could have a natural urge to be attracted to other men and to have intercourse with other men in the same way a man may have a natural urge to have intercourse with a woman. Well, this action may not be as natural as they think because if it was natural, then why were the people of Lut the first people to do it? If this action was in fact natural, as natural as breathing and eating, for example, then it should have been happening since day one of mankind. But the point is, it wasn't. And so what appears to be the case is that this action is not as natural as they think, rather it is from the waswasa of shaitan. It's just that some people may succumb to it and others may not. But even if we agree that it is natural, still it doesn't justify it because you could have certain natural urges but you have to not succumb to them. You have to control yourself. A man may have a natural urge to have intercourse with a woman. So this does not give him permission to rape a woman. He has to control this natural urge. Or for example, greed is also something natural in humans. Every human being has an element of greed. But this needs to be well controlled because if you let it loose, then this will cause havoc. The point is that this homosexuality can be dealt with. And one must not hide behind the fact that he's naturally inclined to other men. So in a case like this, he must not appeal to nature. 
Rather, it is the command of Allah Jalla wa ala, which is first and foremost. There is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. Is the punishment of the homosexual the same as the one of a normal zani? So are they both to be stoned to death? Some have said that the man who commits homosexuality, his punishment is severer. And others have said that it is the same. And they rely on a narration found in Al-Bayhaqi in which the Prophet is reported to have said, إِذَا أَتَى رَجُلُ الرَّجُلَ فَهُمَا زَانِيَانِ if a man comes to another man, meaning they have intercourse together, then both of them are zaniyan, meaning two zani. However, this hadith is da'if. And there is a third opinion, which says that the punishment of the male homosexual is less than that of zina. In other words, it would just be a ta'zir. The majority of the scholars hold that the punishment is more severe than that of conventional zina. And the Sahaba had a consensus that the male homosexual is to be killed. Those who say that the punishment is simply a ta'zir, they say that the natural human inclination repels somebody from committing homosexuality. Men are not naturally attracted to other men. And so if that's the case, then the nature itself would stop somebody from committing this homosexuality. So if somebody was to fall into this, then there would not be a had punishment, rather there would be simply a ta'zir. But this argument appears to be weak because the good nature of a human would also prevent him from committing zina, because the good nature of a human being sees zina as something which is repulsive. But despite that, we do have a had punishment for conventional zina. So we say ultimately we have this hadith, which has been graded authentic by a Shaykh al-Albani, and we also have the ijma' of the Sahaba, that the homosexual has the had punishment of the execution. However, these homosexuals could be of two types. The first type is the repentant type, who knows that this action is haram, but he succumbs to the waswasa of shaitan. So this type of person, for him, repentance is better, and he should be left to that. Just like a person who commits a zina, this is of course wrong, but if he can repent, then this would be better. But then you have many of these types of homosexuals from the Muslims who actually believe and argue that homosexuality is in fact halal. They will say things like, you don't find anywhere in the Qur'an even the word homosexuality mentioned. So how can it be haram? And these people have made a double mistake. Firstly, to actually commit this act of homosexuality. And then secondly, to try to make halal what Allah has made haram. And this in and of itself is kufr. So these people must simply be told what the truth is. If they do not accept, which is most likely to be the case, then this is not the time for any mercy. And these people are in fact murtadun. They are apostates. And this execution had punishment applies to the homosexual whether he is a muhsan or not a muhsan. So this distinction is not made as it is made in the case of zina. But the condition is that this person must be baligh, aqil, alim and multazim. The multazim would be the one who is a Muslim living in a Muslim state or a dhimmi living in a Muslim state because the Islamic law then would apply to these types of people. And also alim meaning he must know that this action is haram. As for how the execution takes place, then this could be down to the ishtihad of the imam, some scholars have suggested ideas, they say that it has to be stoning to death because this is how the Qawm Luth were destroyed or some might opt for the normal decapitation. And then we have the issue of the bestiality which is another sexual deviance and this type of person is to be killed and also the animal is to be killed and this would be the had punishment. The animal is killed because this would be in order to prevent others from committing this act and secondly, if the animal was to live, then people would start to abuse or think evil of this animal, which it does not deserve. So we say about this animal, whom another person has had intercourse with, its meat is not allowed to be eaten because this animal must be killed by way of obligation. And any animal which you have to kill by way of obligation, then its meat is not allowed to be eaten. And this is a general qaida. But then the problem is, if this animal belongs to another man, then the person who had intercourse with this animal would have to pay the owner 
for the loss of this animal. Remember, the animal is to be killed, but this animal does not belong to the man who had intercourse with it. So this man then who committed the sin would have to pay the owner of the animal for the loss. And the payment would be that he would have to give the owner a similar animal. There is another type of sexual deviancy not mentioned in the hadith which is incest. And the punishment for that we have text for is the death penalty. In the Sunan we find that Sa'd ibn Ubada saw his maternal uncle carrying a flag walking somewhere. So he asked him where he's going to and he replied that the Prophet has ordered him to go to this man who married the wife of his father after his father. He said the Prophet ordered him to go and kill him and take his wealth. So incest is another sexual deviancy in which the perpetrator is to be executed and it makes no difference whether this person is a muhsan or not a muhsan. And you'll realize that in all of these sexual deviancies, the mutual consent does not count for anything. So two people could have mutual consent to commit zina or to commit homosexuality or to commit incest and this does not make it halal. Rather we say the halal and the haram come from Allah Jalla wa ala alone. As for the gafir way of life, then it is down to mutual consent. And if it is done through mutual consent, then it's all well and good. But according to this logic, incest and wife swapping should be okay because it is done through mutual consent. So if zina is okay because it's done through mutual consent, then incest and wife swapping is also okay because it is also done through mutual consent. Hadith number 1059. The statement of Ibn Umar, he says that the Prophet flogged and he made taghrib, which means he banished people for the one year. Likewise, Abu Bakr and Umar after him, they also flogged the fornicator and they made taghrib, which is to banish the fornicator from his land for one lunar year. This hadith in At-Tirmidhi is sahih. So there's nothing new which comes out from this narration. It simply proves that the had punishment for the fornicator is that he is to be flogged and he is to be banished from the land. This narration does not tell us how many he is flogged, but we know this from other hadith, of course, he is flogged a hundred lashes. And it does not tell us how long he is banished for, but we know from the other narrations that he is banished for one lunar year. And this narration also proves to us that this idea of flogging and banishing the fornicator is not abrogated because Abu Bakr and Umar carried it out after the Prophet. Of course, we have other evidences which tell us that this applies to the fornication and not the adultery because with the adultery we have evidence that they are to be stoned to death if the conditions are met. It also proves to us that zina would happen even in those days during the time of the Prophet Abu Bakr and Umar and these were the best of generations. So if it took place in those generations, then in this generation, how much more would you expect it to take place? Fallahu musta'an. Hadith 1060 from Ibn Abbas, he says, لَعَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْمُتَخَنِّثِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالْمُتَرَجِّلَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَقَالْ أَخْرِجُوهُمْ مِنْ بُيُوتِكُمْ رواه البخاري. From Ibn Abbas, he says that the Prophet cursed those men who imitate women and those women who imitate men. He said, drive them out of your houses. Al-Bukhari reported it. Allah Jalla wa ala has made men and women different in terms of their looks, appearances and even nature and behavior and also physically, emotionally and intellectually they are different. And when we talk about imitating the opposite gender, it is not just restricted to the clothing you wear or the behavior you have or the type of way in which you talk because some men could speak like women but also in other affairs as well. For example, women should not perform jobs which are more suited to males. For example, if you look at judges, this is a very masculine type of job. So if a woman takes up this job, you would see her becoming much more masculine-like and losing her femininity. Likewise with politicians, you see these women losing their femininity. And this is something which the Sharia seeks to prevent. Women should remain feminine and men should remain masculine. So the point is that both of these types of people, the Prophet والسلام, has cursed them because these are people who are changing the creation of Allah Jalla wa ala. And this is exactly what Shaitan wants. 
And we know in the Sahih that there used to be a man who was very feminine in his nature. And the wives of the Prophet did not think that this man had a particular desire for women. And so he would enter upon the women where a normal man would not be allowed to enter because the normal man has desire for women. And then one day the Prophet ﷺ heard him speak about a woman describing her body as this woman enters and goes away. And this proves that this man does in fact have a desire for women because he's speaking about women in a way which shows that he has some desire. So then the Prophet ordered his wives that this man should not enter in upon you. Because even though from the outside it appears that he's feminine, he does not have any desire for women, but in fact he does have desire for women because he at heart is a male. So he's not allowed to enter in upon the women. And so we find in this narration the Prophet ﷺ is saying, min buyutikum, Drive them out of your houses. They must not be allowed to enter in upon the women folk because even though these types of people may seem feminine and it may appear that they don't have any desire for women because they are feminine themselves but in reality they do have desire for women because at heart they are still men. Now the thing is if he cursed such people who imitate the opposite gender then what would be your opinion about those who actually have a sex change? what we would call transsexuals. Allah musta'an. Hadith 1061 From Abu Hurairah, the Prophet والسلام, is reported to have said, اِدْفَعُوا الْحُدُودَ مَا وَجَدْتُمْ لَهَا مَدْفَعًا أَخْرَجَهُ بْنُ مَاجَةً بِإِسْنَادٍ ضَعِيفٍ The Prophet is reported to have said, ward off the had punishment as long as you can find a means to ward it off. The Hadith is ضعيف. At-Tirmidhi and Al-Hakim have another from Aisha. إِدْرَأُوا الْحُدُودَ عَنِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مَا اسْتَضَعْتُمْ Word of the had punishments from the Muslims as much as you are able to do so. This is also the Aif and Al-Bayhaqi has another version. إِدْرَأُوا الْحُدُودَ بِالشُّبُهَات Word of the had punishments if there is some shubuha or some doubtful matters. Again, these are all the Aif. These narrations are da'if and just as well because every act of a had punishment would bring forth its doubtful matters. And people are experts at bringing forth shubuhat or doubtful matters. So we can be sure that every had situation will have a doubtful matter. But the point is we say if this doubtful matter is genuine and a strong enough doubt then that's fair enough. Otherwise, we will not take a look at every single doubtful matter. The had punishments is the right of Allah Jalla wa'ala. So if it reaches the hakim, it must be carried out. But the rights of Allah Jalla wa'ala are based upon forgiveness and hiding somebody's sin. So if there is a genuine doubt as to whether the had punishment should be validly carried out, then we would ward off this had punishment. And so this is the opinion of most of the scholars, is that if there is a valid doubt, then we do not carry out the had punishment. But then the whole issue is about whether the doubt is valid or not. And so this is why we do not take this hadith in its absolute sense. So every time any doubt comes along, we would ward off the had punishment. Because if that was the case, then there would be no had punishment ever being established. So we say if there is a valid doubt, then for us to make a mistake in not giving him the had punishment is easier and less serious than for us to make a mistake in giving him the had punishment. But again, we stress this is only for valid doubts. Hadith number 1062 from Ibn Umar, the Prophet said, Whoever receives it رواه الحاكم وهو في الموطأ من مراسيل زيد بن أسلم. The Prophet said, Avoid all of these dirty acts which Allah has forbidden. But whoever commits one of these, then let him conceal himself with the concealment of Allah and let him repent to Allah. Because whoever exposes his sin to us, then we will establish on him the book of Allah Ta'ala, meaning the hath punishment. The hadith is sahih. We take from this hadith that it is obligatory to avoid all those sinful actions which Allah Jalla has prohibited. By qadurat, the Prophet intends here as zina. This comes from qadr, which means dirt. So these are the dirty actions. 
Of course not physically dirty, but spiritually dirty. And if you do happen to fall into this, then you have to do two things. Conceal yourself, so don't openly show it, and do not openly brag about it, because this is even worse and shameless. And then secondly, you have to repent to Allah Jalla wa Ala, fulfilling the five criteria of repentance. But here we have a question. Have we not encountered those narrations in which Ma'iz came to the Prophet, telling him that he committed zina, and that woman from Johanna telling the Prophet that she is pregnant out of zina? So they didn't conceal themselves, did they? No, they didn't, but we say that it is permissible for you to take revenge on your own self by being punished for your sin. And we said that the safer option is to take the punishment because that way you know you will not be punished in the hereafter. But some people may think that their tawbah may not be accepted. This is why they would take the punishment in this life. Otherwise, you have the option you can do either. So the tawbah is wajib, without a doubt. And as for concealing the sin, well, you can conceal it or you can take it to the Qadi and receive the punishment. So the concealment is not wajib if you commit a sin which incurs the had punishment. But the tawbah in all cases is wajib. And like the Prophet says here, whoever tells us that he committed a sin which incurs the had punishment, then we will establish the Book of Allah upon him. It means that when the case gets taken to court and it gets taken to the Qadi, then it is obligatory upon the Qadi to establish the had punishment Otherwise, the Qadi would be guilty of disobeying Allah Jalla wa ala. And any act of forgiveness should be done before the matter gets taken to the Qadi. And in a narration in which Safwan ibn Umayyah tried to intercede on behalf of the person who stole his chainmail, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Why did you not forgive him before you took him to me? So now that you've taken him to me, the hand needs to be chopped off. So if you wanted to forgive him, it should have been before you take him to the Qadi. And likewise, the Prophet censured Usama ibn Zayd when he tried to intercede for a woman who was of a high status and she was guilty of stealing. He said to Usama, أَتَشْفَعُ فِي حَدٍ مِنْ حُدُودِ اللَّهِ Are you interceding to ward off one of the had punishments of Allah? The Prophet became angry. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. The had punishment of zina for servant women is half that of free women. We know that through the text. Now discuss whether the same rule should be applied to male servants or not. Discuss both opinions. Question number two. The Prophet told us that if your servant woman commits zina for the third time, you should sell her. And this is by way of obligation. State two reasons why she should be sold apart from the actual textual evidence. Question number three. State the ruling on sodomy and bestiality and incest.